Okay, Shabbat Shalom everybody. Uh, welcome to Secrets Revealed, Tavniot. Um, pictures in English. Uh, my wife is off on the sides, so you might hear or might not. Um, but our family finally left, so hopefully next week we'll, she'll have a teaching ready and we'll be able to start teaching together again as she rolls her eyes at me. Um, There's another family coming in next week. Oh, wonderful. More family. It's summertime. We have visitors. There you go. Summer. She says it's summertime. We got visitors, just in case you didn't hear. So, um, today is the 23rd of June. It is the 2nd of Tammuz. Um, the new moon of Tammuz was on Thursday, so um, if I remember, I've got my prayer book out. Hopefully I'll remember at the end of the um, teaching to uh, do the blessing for the new moon for the, for the month of Tammuz. Um, today's Torah portion is Korach, um, one of six Torah portions that are actually named for a person that is in that portion. Uh, some of the other ones are Bilam, uh, Pinchas, Chayai Sarah, um, Horak. Uh, there's two more, and I'm, I'm blanking out on. The, let's see if I can spot them. Balak. Uh, oh, Noach was one. Um, And I think there's one more, but I can't remember offhand who it is. Anyways, not important. There's, there's several. Noach, uh, let's see, Chayai Sarah. Um, might as well just go through... Uh, Yitro, that's the last one. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. So, okay, so, um, six portions named for people. All the others are based on, and again, you know, as Torah portions are named, they're named because of the first word or um, a word in the first um, verse or second verse of the portion which describes what that portion is about. Um, so we're beginning Korach. Korach usually coincides within a week or two of the 17th of Tammuz, which is a bad time in the time of Judaism. Uh, a beginning of a period of mourning for the temple. Uh, in this case, it's about two weeks away. Uh, oh, and speaking of two weeks away, is the National Messianic Jewish Convention. So hopefully somebody will watch this and, and recognize me and go, Hey, aren't you that guy that does Secrets Revealed? So if you're watching this, you go to the Messianic Convention in uh, Grantham, PA, and you see me, let me know what you think, good or bad. I doesn't matter to me. I just I want to know if I'm doing well, if I'm teaching Scripture accurately, if I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I'm doing accurately for the kingdom. So, um, on that note, let me go ahead and start with some prayer. And we will go from there. So, Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that you have opened the doors of your vaults for this teaching. I thank you that you've opened the door to your secrets. And Father, I thank you that you, you continually open the doors to your secrets because you want us to know what it is that you, you have for us and you want us to know what your plan for us is. And Father, I thank you that you will continue to open these doors and continue to teach us 
your will, your desire, and your plan of salvation. And Yeshua, your son, whose name means salvation. Amen. Okay, so let me change screens. One of these years, we will actually have a crew that does all this for me. All right, Korach, Bemidbar. Um, last year, we uh, went through chapter 16, verse 1, through uh, 1715. Now, if you are following along in a Gentile Bible and a, a non-Jewish Bible, you will see that we went actually from 16.1 to 16.50. <coughs> Excuse me. This is one of the um, portion or one of the areas in the scripture where the Jewish tor the the um, separating of verses and chapters differs in the Jewish counting from the Gentile counting. In the Jewish counting, the first fifteen verses, or well, the last fifteen verses of chapter 16 are actually the first 15 verses of chapter 17 um, and this and chapter 17 actually will end with verse 25 I believe maybe 26 uh, I've, I've got it in here so we'll kind of talk about it um, speaking of and then 18 1 they coincide again so and we're going Today we are going through um, chapter 18, verse 7. Uh, basically, we're covering maybe 30 verses today. Not very much, not a long portion. The Korach is actually also one of the s shortest portions in um, the Torah portion cycle. So uh, we'll go ahead and go through that, but this is always one that is separated from other portions. All right, so let's hit our review. Uh, the review. So last year, about this time, we were looking at Korach. Uh, I believe we also, yeah, nope, just Korach. And we looked at his name, uh, Korach bin Yitzar bin Kehat bin Levi, with Datan and Aviram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuven, took men. That's how this portion starts. The name Korach actually means bald, to make bald. Um, and we've discussed this before, but not in depth, and we haven't hit that actual Torah portion where we will talk about it in depth. But hair is a picture of Jews, so to make oneself bald, unless it's for the Nazarite vow, and we talked about this a little a couple of weeks ago, is not actually a Hebrew thing. Now, if you're going bald and you're bald naturally, that's not a bad thing. It's it's natural. It's the way God made you. But um, to make oneself bald is actually against Torah. So we talked a little bit about that. Then we looked at, we actually looked at the rebellion of Korach, uh, 250 leaders, how they took a, a, a little bit of truth and um, expanded it into a falsehood. A lot of that going around today, even. Uh, then we looked at, how Korach thought he was going to, he, he was more important because as a, in, in the um, Talmud, in the Mishnah, or actually in the, in the um, uh, Midrash, in the Midrash talking about these stories, Korach thought that he was in the right because he saw in the future his sons um, writing psalms in the temple. So he thought he was right. Well, obviously he wasn't. 
We looked at a censer versus a makta. Makta is the Hebrew word that is usually translated censer, but it actually means more like a fire pan. And if you have a fireplace at home and you have a shovel that goes with that fireplace, that's what a makta looks like. It's actually designed so that when the priest holds it, it actually looks like an extension of his hand. And where they get that front, where they get that picture from, well, where Isaiah shows us where that picture came from is in Isaiah, Ezekiel, I'm sorry, chapter one, talking about the the um, living beings, the the um, cherubim that surround God or are under God's throne. Between them, there's um, darts of fire. One of the cherubim, or a cherubim, a, a, actually a malchim, is told to take a, coal, a, a bit of that fire, and he uses his hands to grab the fire. Well, we obviously can't grab fire with our hands as humans. So the rabbis, well, Moses and Aholiav and um, the other guy, blanking out on his name right now, grabbed these, uh, you know, they came up with this shovel that was set up so that it had something here to hold it from going right and left, and the priest could hold it on his hand with his hand, and it looked like an extension of his arm. Ezekiel saw that and said, oh, that's the fire pen, that's the makte. Um, so that was where that is the difference. It, it became a bowl uh, in Revelation. It's called, a, it's translated bowl. Um, the Catholic Church has got this thing attached to a chain and it's got um, a, cup, a top on it that has um, holes to allow smoke to come through. All sorts of stuff and it all comes from false drawings of what somebody thought this thing looked like. Instead of actually looking at the word and realizing that it was a shovel that they used to remove the coals from the altar, they came up with 5,000 different other things and none of them were right. So then we looked at the discipline of Datanan Aviram. If it was something new, then we knew it was from God. And what happened? The earth opened up, which had never happened before, and swallowed them alive. So we looked at that. We, oops, sorry about that. We looked at um, how the Maktot, and here I have to clear up some false teaching. If you were listening last year, somehow I, I don't think this teaching actually made it to the internet again. So in the older, I should have actually looked. I didn't look. I, I could have done the whole thing. Maktot is plural for makta. Makta is feminine. It's a feminine noun, means fire pan. The plural of that is maktot. So, um, clear up a little. I, I, I was saying maktiim, I believe it was. Maktiim. But they're maktot, not maktiim. Um, and after Datan and Aviram, after the 250 men who said, we should be priests too, because, you know, we hear just as much from God as they do, um, and were fried, they took those fire pans and placed them and made them part of the bronze altar. Uh, and then we saw the people rebelling again. And that's where we pick it up. Bemid Bar. 1716 in the Hebrew Bible, if you're following along with a JPS or I believe a uh, uh, Stern, uh, what is that, Jewish Bible, complete Jewish Bible, it'll be 1716. If you're following along in our wonderful King James inspired English Bible, it will be 17 verse 1. So let me go ahead and turn there. Numbers 29, 18, 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe saying, 
Speak to the sons of Israel, and get from them a rod for each father's household, twelve rods from their, all their leaders, according to the father's household. You shall write each name on his rod, and, Aharon, and write Aharon's name on the rod for, of Levi. For there is one rod for the head of each of the father's households. You shall then deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. And it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Thus I shall lessen, upon, lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the sons of Israel who are grumbling against you. Moshe therefore spoke to the sons of Israel and all their leaders gave him a rod apiece for each leader according to the father's households, 12 rods with the rod of Aharon among their rods. We're almost there. Um, so Moses deposited the rods before the Lord in the tent of, of the testimony. Now it came about on the next day that Moshe went into the tent of the testimony and behold, the rod of Aharon for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. Okay, I'm stopping here. Because I love, sort of, almonds. Almonds are a wonderful thing. All right, so let's backtrack to the first verse we read. God tells the leaders through Moshe, get a, get a rod, a staff. Basically, it's a staff. Bring it up here. Put your name on it. And I'm going to pick the tribe that I want to be in charge. So the names of the leaders were written on each one. So they could identify it. Um, I'm not going to go through the names. But each one. And then they were placed before the ark. It says... Um, You shall deposit them in the tent of meeting in front of the testimony where I meet with you. God told Moses to make the ark, the top of the ark, a seat where he will meet from between the cherubim. So you got your two cherubim. They're standing straight up. One has his hand out like, one has a wing out like this, the other wing out like this. The one in the middle, let's say this is, let's see, yeah, let's say this one is the one in the middle. It's touching the other one, and it kind of looks like a seat with the rest of the box coming out in front of them. Um, so they place these rods in front of the ark, where... Moshe meets with God. And God says the rod that grows will be the sign. Come about that the rod of the man who I, whom I choose will sprout. And what are we talking about? Well, if we backtrack to chapter 16, or what we read last year, we've been talking about rebellion. Korach. Datan Aviram led a rebellion. Um, then, the next day, after God said, I picked Moses and Aaron, the people were like, oh, we're going to die. Ah, and they had huge murmurings. And the plague spread out through. Aaron ran out and stopped the plague. Well, we're in that same day. God says, okay, look, I've had it with these guys again. We need to teach them who is in charge. I put Moses and Aaron in charge. So Aaron's rod is chosen. That's the sign. The one that, that God chooses something different will happen. So the next day, Aaron's rod had buds, blossoms, and right... Oops. Sorry about that. I hate it when that happens. Buds, blossoms, and ripe almonds. So, why almonds? I always ask this question. Why almonds? Oh, I forgot to mention. Rod. 
Staff Branch Tribe. It's number 4294. Um, it can also mean a tribe. The same word for um, staff can also mean a tribe. Uh, it comes from the word uh, nata, which means it's a verb, which means to stretch out, to extend, spread out, pitch, um, turn, pervert, incline, bend, or bow. Um, to turn, incline, influence. So this rod, these rods were um, to a picture of stretching out. Uh, let me get to the next one here. So white almonds. Almost there. Why almonds? Well, the word for almond is shaked. Uh, there it is, kind of difficult to see, but there it is in Hebrew. Literally means almond tree or almonds. It comes from number 8245, which is two words back in the Strong's, which literally means to wake, to wake, to watch, awake, be alert. It's a verb. means to wake up. The um, almond tree in Israel is one of the first trees to bloom and bring forth ripe fruit. Actually, throughout the world. It is one of the first trees to bloom and bring forth ripe fruit. So that word, which describes the almond tree, is how Adam named it wake up, the wake-up tree, basically. In Hebrew, it's called the wake-up tree. We also have the shape of the menorah. If we go to Shemot 25, or Exodus 25, for those of us who are not quite up on our Hebrew books yet, we say this. Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Table show, okay, verse 31. Then you shall make a lampstand, a menorah of pure gold. The menorah, its base and its shaft are to be made of hammered work. Its cups, its bulbs, and its flowers shall be with it, of one piece, with it. And six branches shall go out from the, its sides, three branches of the lampstand from its one side, and three branches of the lampstand from its other side. Three cups shaped like almonds, almond blossoms in the one branch, a bulb and a flower. The three cups shaped like almond blossoms in the other branch, a bulb and a flower. For the six branches going out from the lampstand. In the lamps and in the lampstand, four cups shaped like almonds in its bulbs and its flowers. And a bulb shall be under the first pair of branches coming out of it and a bulb under the second pair of branches, and a bulb coming out of the third pair of branches coming out of it, for the six branches coming out of the lampstand, out of the menorah. The bulbs and their branches shall be of one piece with it. All of it shall be one piece of hammered work of pure gold. Then you shall make its lamps, seven in number. So, the lampstand was built like an almond tree. Um... I wish I still had the picture, but I had this really cool picture. This guy gave it to me when I was in El Paso because he knew I liked, liked Jewish stuff. And it was an almond tree. But the branches, in this particular view, the branches had branched out straight out because I had shown him the picture of the menorah that I have from our old rabbi. And he's like, oh, man. I got something for you, and, and he showed me this picture, and it was more than three branches on either side, but they went straight out and straight up at a 45 degree angle. Looked like the menorah that I think the menorah looks like. And it was an almond tree. Um, Jeremiah 1, 11. Let's, not a whole lot of verses that I can think of, but I got all sorts of neat stuff today. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah likes getting lost. There he is. 
one, eleven. Oh wow, I even have it. So, the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you see, Jeremiah? And I said, I see a rot. This is the same word as what was picked in, Kor in the portion of Korach, what we're reading now. Of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. And then he talks about destruction of, it, of Jerusalem. So, the almond tree is also a picture of God's word. Well, what is God's word? Yeshua. Yeshua is a picture of the, this is a long, and I'm going to kind of give you some more stuff to show you how I, why I think that. Um, but a, a long A plus B equals D thing. The almond tree is the wake up tree. It, it's, it's the first to rise, first to bloom. Resurrection, it's a picture of resurrection. The almond branch or the almond rod is also a picture of the Messiah in that verse we read in Jeremiah 1. I am watching over my word. The word in John chapter 1 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God's word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Yeshua. He was describing Yeshua when he said that. So if we take those two verses, put them together, Yeshua is the almond rod. Now, check this out. Uh, possibly, now this is um, kind of stretching a little. Possibly from the tree of life, but Ben Midbar 21, a couple chapters past where we're at now. And please do not count this as doctrine. This is my supposition. This is what I was taught, but it was not taught as doctrine. It was taught as mm, a definite possibility. Um, Numbers 21, verse 7. Uh, verse 6. And the Lord sent fire serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moshe and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord. This is them rebelling again. And you intercede with the Lord. Or, um, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moshe, make a fiery and in my Bible it says serpent, but that word is an italicized. So make it fiery and set it on a standard and it shall come about that everyone who is to, who is bitten, when he looks at it, he shall live. Okay. So here we go. John 3.14. John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Yochanan 3.14. Nice. Turn almost right to it. To, going slowly. Uh, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? So this is Yeshua talking to a Pharisee who's coming to him at night. Um, he's already talked about being born again. So Yeshua answered, how can these things be? And Yeshua answered and said, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? In other words, you're a rabbi. Why don't you understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have seen and you do not receive our witness. He's talking about himself and the Ruach. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes may, believes may in him have eternal life. So, 
This is the picture. Moshe lifts up the serpent in the wilderness. So people look up at him and are saved. It's to be a picture. Now, Yeshua says, as Moshe lifted up that serpent, so I need to be lifted up so that all men are saved. Now, this is where it gets interesting. According to rabbinic tradition, and again, this is tradition. This is not fact. There's nowhere in the scriptures we're going to find this. But it's, it's interesting to pull this all together. Um, this is in um, a Haggadic modification talking about Aharon's rod. Uh, actually, this whole thing is from the Jewish Encyclopedia online. And, and I just had to download it because it was cool and print it. It was only three pages. Um, if you didn't include all the A through Z listings beforehand. Uh, Aaron's rod. Biblical data. A rod which, in the hands of Aaron, the high priest, was endowed with miraculous power during the several plagues that preceded the Exodus. In this function, the rod of Moses was equally potent. Upon two occasions, however, the, single, the singular virtue of spontaneous power when not in the grasp of its possessor, was exhibited by Aaron's rod. At one time it swallowed the rods of the Egyptian magicians, and at another it blossomed and bore fruit in the tabernacle, as evidence of the exclusive right of the, to the priesthood of the tribe of Levi, and more specifically the Kohanim. In commemoration of this decision, it was charged the rod be put again before the testimony. A later tradition asserts that the rod was kept in the Ark of the Covenant. The main fact, however, is thus confirmed that a rod was preserved in the tabernacle as a relic of the institution of the Aharonic priesthood. So, in rabbinic literature, the Bible describes similar miraculous powers to the rod of Aharon and to the staff of Moses. My contention is the rod of Aaron and the staff of Moses are the same staff. Um, Exodus chapter 4, I believe it is, God tells Moses to give Aaron his staff. Or um, During the plagues, God tells Aaron, Moses to give Aaron the staff. So, um, let's see, the Bible, Bible ascribes similar miraculous powers to the rod of Aaron and to the staff of Moses. The Haggadah goes a step further and entirely identifies the rod of Aaron with that of Moshe. Thus, the Midrash Yelimdenu Yel states that the staff with which Jacob crossed the Yardin is, ident is identical to that which Judah gave to his daughter-in-law Tamar. It is likewise the holy rod with which Moshe worked with which Aaron performed wonders before Pharaoh, and with which finally David slew the giant Goliath. David left it to his seed, and, to, and the Davidic kings used it as a scepter with, until the destruction of the temple. When, it's miraculous, when it miraculously disappeared, when the Messiah comes, it will be given to him for a scepter in token of his authority over the heathen. Now, Basically, um, this is, again, this is tradition. This is rabbinic tradition. This is not biblical fact. But they do use the Bible to teach some of this. Um, the Haggadic modification. Legends has still more to say concerning this. God created in the twilight of the sixth day of creation and delivered it to Adam when the latter was driven from paradise. After it passed through the hands of Shem, Enoch, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov successively, successively, it came into the possession of Joseph. On Joseph's death, the Egyptian nobles stole some of his belongings, and among them, Yitro appropriated the staff. Yitro planted the staff in his garden. When, it miraculous, when its miraculous virtue was revealed by the fact that nobody could withdraw it from the ground, even to touch it was fraught with danger to life. 
This was because the ineffable name of God was engraved upon it. That's the yod heh vav -He. But nobody could read it, so they didn't know who, who, belong, who it belonged to. When Moses entered Yitro's household, he read the name, and by means of it was able to draw up the rod, for which service Zipporah, Yitro's daughter, was given to him in marriage. Her father had sworn that she should become the wife of the man who should be able to master the miraculous rod and no other. It must, however, be remarked that the Mishnah, a vote um, nine, as yet knew nothing of the miraculous creation of Aaron's rod, which is first mentioned by the Mekilta and Sifre on Deuteronomy. This supposed fact of the supernatural origin of the rod explains the statement in the New Testament, Hebrews um, 9.4, which talks about the rod being placed before the um, ark, and Tosafet Yoma 3.7. It is to be interpreted thus according to uh, BB14A, which I think is Bava Bur... Do I have that? Um... No. Uh, Baba, it's one of, it's Talmudic, that Aaron's rod, together with its blossoms and fruit, was preserved in the ark. King Josiah, who foresaw the impending national catastrophe, concealed the ark and its contents in Sota 13a, and their whereabouts will remain unknown until, in the Messianic age, the prophet Eliyahu shall, rev shall reveal them. So, and then it has Christian modifications, which I'm not going to get into because that's not rabbinic. So, but this says it came from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, check this out. If this same rod is the rod that Moshe put the serpent on, and it was to bring life to those who were bit, why would it be the truck? tree of knowledge of good and evil. It would be the tree of life that that staff came from. Yeshua is the branch in Zechariah. Uh, Yeshua the high priest was prophesied that his name is a branch. Um, and it was a prophecy of the Messiah. So that's one of the names of Messiah is branch. If a piece of the branch was given to Adam and then carried down through the sons that followed God's ways until it ended up with Moshe. Now, this is what happened. It was pa Basically, this says that it was passed down through David. Now, this is what I believe happened. It became an idol. Go to 2 Kings 18. Kings. Second Kings 18.4. Now, verse 1. Now it came about in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiahu, ben Ahaz, king of Yehuda, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Avi, the daughter of Zechariah. This may or may not be the prophet, I'm not sure. And he did write in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moshe had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. Um... See, note uh, 18. Is it that one? 22. Uh, no. Uh, Second Chronicles 29 is where the other is the parallel passage to this. Um, no, 
and I did not look this, I apologize for not looking this up, but, um, One check. Let me look at one more thing. Second Kings 15, 4. That's got 31 1. Uh. Somewhere it mentions that this Nehushtan was actually on the Mount of Olives. It was planted on the Mount of Olives. I can't remember exactly where it was. But that's where they would go to worship. It was relatively close to the temple, but not in the temple. It was across... The, um, if you've ever been to Israel, it's less than a 2,000 cubit walk from... The Mount of Olives to the Temple Mount. So within that space of 2,000 cubits was this um, idol, which actually was from the time of Moshe. And it was something God had created that was corrupted later on. So this staff is a picture of the resurrection. It's supposed to be a picture of the resurrection, to be able to look at it and, and be... Um, healed from your sickness, your illness. Um, basically, life came from the dead. So, let's continue on. Uh, back to Bemidbar. So, I, I honestly believe that this rod that it budded was from the tree of life. It was the rod that Aaron was passed down from Adam through the uh, lineage through um, to Aaron. I found someplace, I, I had been taught someplace else that it actually counted the lineage of how it was passed down through to the time of David. But I couldn't find that while I was studying yesterday. So, continue on. Uh, 1724 or verse 9 in the Gentile Bible, Moses then brought out all the rods from the presence of the Lord to all the sons of Israel. And they looked, and each man took his rod. Uh, but the Lord said to Moshe, Put back the rod of Aharon before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me, so that they should not die. Thus Moshe did, just as the Lord had charged him, so he did. Then the sons of Israel spoke to Moshe, saying, Behold, we're pale, we perish, we're dying, we're all dying. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Are we to perish completely? <sighs> Each man took his rod. <laughs> Oh, I, you know, I, I do this myself. It's like things start looking like they're going good. All of a sudden, something happens. Another test comes, and it's like, oh, God, here I go again. We're dying here. What's going on? God's constantly testing us. Uh, each man took his rod. Um... They had Aaron place his rod, God had Aaron put his rod back in the temp tabernacle in front of the ark. It says they're in front of the ark, not in the ark. Um, and Israel starts feeling sorry for themselves again. You know, when people start asking me why we should read the book, the Torah, why we should read the first five books? Because didn't Jesus do away with all those? No, he didn't. But it's also a little bit of comedy, a little bit of human life, which is a little bit of comedy, if you think about it. 
we start the littlest thing crops up and most of us not all of us but most of us go oh woe is me i'm dying i'm gonna die it's horrible i can't do anything and i was like all right well I, I have to remind myself, okay, what is the test God is teaching me at this time? That's what we all need to do. Why are we being tested? Did I do something wrong or is it a test? Um, we were talking about healing. The, Lynn and I were talking about healing the other day. And Yeshua is very specific about the man, at, the blind man at Bethsaida. The, the apostle or the Talmudim asked him, "Is it was it this man's sin or was it his parents' sin that that caused him to be born blind?" And Yeshua said, "It was neither. This was to show the power of God." So he didn't say, "If we sin, we won't get sick," what he's or something happened to us. He, what he said was. To, to paraphrase what he's saying, there's three ways you can get sick. Parent, your parents' sin, generational sin, brings disease through a generational disease, through your DNA in reality. I uh, heard somewhere there was a, a study that said when somebody does something wrong, it affects the DNA, and it's passed to the children. <clears throat> it takes a couple of generations to work its way out. Their sin? How many times did Yeshua say, Go sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. Sin no more to somebody he was healing. So obviously it was their sin that was causing the problem, not just because. And finally, there is the illness that is there to show the power of God. When we pray for healing, when we pray for somebody to be healed, you need to know why that person is inflicted with that disease or that malady. Because if you pray the wrong prayer, ain't nothing gonna happen. Or it'll be a temporary fix. You gotta know why the person's sick. Is it something they did? Is it something their parents did? Talking maybe generations back, three, four generations back. Or is it to show the glory of God? So we start feeling sorry for ourselves. And um, we let Hasatan enter and we don't follow through with what God has promised. So I've been trying not to feel sorry for myself and keep going with this teaching. And yeah. I have fun doing it when it's when it's time to do it. All right, so let's continue on. Let's finish this up. Last seven verses. So the Lord spoke to our own, you and your sons and your father's household with you shall bear the guilt and connection with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the guilt and connection with your priesthood. But bring with you also your brothers, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your fathers, that they may be joined with you and serve you, while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. And they shall thus attend to your obligation and to the obligations of, at, of all the tent, but they shall not come near to the furnishings of the sanctuary and the altar, lest both they and you die. And they shall be joined with you and attend to the obligations of the tent of meeting for all the service of the tent, but an outsider may not come near you. So you shall attend to the obligation of the sanctuary and, of, and the obligations of the altar, that there may no longer be wrath on the sons of Israel. And behold, I myself have taken your fellow Levites from among the sons of Israel. They are a gift to you dedicated to the Lord to perform the service of the tent of meeting. But you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything concerning the altar and inside the veil, and you are to perform service. I am giving you the priesthood as a bestowed service. 
Uh, another way to say that is service of a gift. Service of gift, but the outsider, the stranger who comes near, shall be put to death. All right. Let's see, where are we at? We're, uh, 50. we're at 50 minutes, so we're almost done. So Aaron and his sons bear the guilt of... the, And this is where we kind of get things mixed up. Bear the guilt of the tabernacle and the priesthood. He's not talking about guilt of sin. Guilt is not necessarily sin. But when... They do the sacrifices. When they take care of the different things, they become unclean. When they become unclean, they bear their guilt. The guilt is from the uncleanness of the... It's not a bad guilt. It's, a, it's an okay thing because they're in the service of God. So to, be, to have guilt is not necessarily a bad thing if it was done for the service of God. If it was something that God told you to do and it caused harm but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be sorry if you cause harm it just means that it's something that's part of the service uh, the way they incurred the guilt they ate part of the sacrifice so they were actually incurring the guilt of Israel on themselves just like the Messiah bears our guilt so he bore our guilt to the tabernacle in heaven when he died so that we don't need to be guilty anymore. We don't need to feel guilt. It drives people insane that I don't feel guilt. I feel sad. I am, I feel self-pity, which is not from God. But if I'm doing something and I get somebody upset because I'm telling them the truth, I don't have guilt over it. I if I was being mean, I repent, but I don't get, I don't have a guilt over it. So the sons of Levi are given to the sons of Aaron as helpers. The priesthood is given the concerns of the altar inside the veil and the service. They all, and they all bear guilt. So, and Messiah bears our guilt. And that's, It. Not bad. 52 minutes. Um, I can turn that off now. So, basically this Torah portion starts off with rebellion and then it just solidifies the, the fact that the Kohanim are God's chosen leaders. This doesn't include the kingship, but you know, as, as we get closer and closer to that day, I, I know I will have a teaching for you about how Yeshua is both priest and king. Even though as he was walking here on earth, he was only of the family of the kings. So, but that gave him the right to bear our guilt. Um, So that's about that, and it goes in. It eventually goes into the priest portion, the duties of the Levites. Finally, the priest portion, and we're done with that section. So next week we talk about Hukat. I've already talked about the red heifer. Ah, uh, I don't know where we're getting into next week, but now yeah, we'll see when we get there. So let's go ahead and uh, close out for anybody who has questions, feel free to email me, um, send me a message, you know, if you see me on Facebook, you see me on YouTube, um, they both have links to my email, so just ask me a question. I, I have no problems answering questions if something's unclear. Um, and I, I might actually add more verses um, to clarify what it is that I'm trying to say. So, Father, I thank you for today. I thank Oh, almost forgot the new moon. Um, bless.
Blessed are you, Lord our God, everlasting King, who by his word created the heavens and all their hosts. By the breath of his mouth he gave to them a decree and an appointed time, that they should not deviate from their charge. They rejoice and are glad when performing their will of the will of their creator. Their maker is true and his work is true. He ordered the moon to renew itself every month as a crown of beauty over Israel. Those who are born by him from birth and as a picture that they likewise will be recreated in the future and will worship their maker in his glorious kingdom. Baruch ata Adonai Mechadesh Mechadesh Chadashim Chadashim Blessed are you, Lord, who renews the moons. Uh, and we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, she who has no light of her own shall be established forever as the kingdom and the seed of David. For you have caused us to be born again into a living hope through the covenant of Yeshua, a light to the Gentiles, a reflection of your glorious kingdom to come. Amen. All right, Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this new moon of Tammuz. And Father, even though it's not a fun time, I thank you for the three weeks coming up, starting with the 17th of Tammuz. I thank you for this Torah portion today. It starts in rebellion, but ends in your solidifying the priesthood of Aaron and the Levites. And Father, I thank you that you have opened the door of the Gentiles to enter your kingdom and to rejoice as both priests and Levites, as, as you say in Isaiah 66, I will take some of them from the nations and make them priests and Levites to serve in the Holy Temple. And Father, I thank you that you've opened the doors for us to see into your Holy Word. Thank you for the almond tree, Father, the picture of resurrection. In Yeshua, our Messiah's name. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.